Hello, and welcome to the lecture on Six Characters in Search of an Author, Act Two. In this lecture, I'll be looking at the second act of the play using the critical literary theory of cultural studies, particularly through the lens of philosophy. I'll also be introducing you to a few questions about how you can use critical theory in interpreting this act of the play. Cultural studies is a broad lens for examining a wide variety of cultural products like literature. This theory encompasses sociology, economics, literature, media or film, and philosophy, among others. A reader that uses the cultural studies lens to analyze a text may focus on how the text deals with cultural issues such as gender, social class, race, sexuality, or nationality. For this week, we will narrow our focus in cultural studies to the way that Six Characters examines gender, social class, and philosophy. So let's look at Act 2. In this act, we get a fuller explanation of the tragic side of the character's story. The stepdaughter has been forced into prostitution because of her family's poverty. Here's the breakdown of the relationship between the characters for clarity. There's the father and mother who had the son. The father saw or thought that the mother was in love with another man, so he told the mother to leave. He also wanted to be free of his own family. The mother and other man has stepdaughter, boy, and girl. The father somewhat regrets letting mother leave. He follows her and her new family, especially the stepdaughter. The other man dies, leaving mother, stepdaughter, boy, and girl in poverty. Mother tries to earn money by sewing for Madame Pache, but Madame Pache uses this as a way to get the stepdaughter into prostitution. The father goes to Madame Pache's and unknowingly gets matched up with the stepdaughter. Eventually, father takes the family back in. In Act 2, the essential scene to be depicted is the encounter between the father and the stepdaughter at Madame Pache's house of prostitution. The action of this scene is given by the characters, recorded by the prompter, interpreted by the manager director, and then recreated in a different but similar version by the actors. The process, the text suggests, is how art moves from being eternal, which is represented by the characters, to an interpreted representation, which is how it's portrayed by the actors. Remember, the characters are not people or other actors. They represent ideas. They are live literature that has come to life, as if Hamlet or Allison from Wonderland or sudden, um, any other character that you can think of suddenly appeared in a classroom or in your living room. It's important to remember this in order to understand the way that the text is contrasting art and reality. For our discussion of cultural studies this week, I will explain the way we can interpret the text from a philosophical perspective. Then, I will give you some hints about how to use a cultural studies lens to interpret the text from a gender or social class perspective, and you can apply this to our optional discussion board. Obviously, this play is extremely philosophical in general, since it is less about plot and more about commentary on the nature of art. However, we can try to interpret it within distinct philosophical terms by comparing parts of Act II to the philosopher Plato's theory of art. Doing so allows us to view the play through a cultural studies lens and to argue for an interpretation of it based strictly within the study of philosophy. In Act II, we again see the discussion of art versus reality that runs throughout the play. The characters want things to be depicted exactly as they happened in the world of art, where they were written down by the author in the unfinished text. However, the actors are only interested in recreating a similar situation or an interpretation. The Greek philosopher Plato lived from roughly 428 to 348 BC. He proposed the idea that art, and this would include literature, is not truthful. In fact, he finds it to be borderline immoral because it presents lies and asks people to focus on them instead of on the ideas themselves. Ideas, he claims, are eternal and unchanging, like the characters, while representing those ideas moves us away from the truth. Here's a breakdown of Plato's theory. Art and literature, he said, are thrice removed from reality. You start out in the world of ideas. This is the most real form. Then, man would take an idea and create a product based on that idea. It would be a copy of that ideal form, which is the idea itself. Then, an artist would take whatever that product that the man had made 
and create a copy of a copy by creating an artistic representation of it. You can think of it using the example of a table. If I think of a table in my mind, that image of a table in my mind, Plato would say, is the most real. It's the world of ideas, and those ideas are eternal. Then if I actually go and make a table, I've created a product. That's a copy of the image that was in my mind. It's not as real as the image, he says. Then if I was an artist, I could look at the table that I had made, and I could do a painting of that table. Now I'm three steps away from the original idea. And we can apply this same theory to the way that Act 2 of Six Characters works by comparing the process of representing the scene to Plato's theory. So in this case, we have the world of ideas represented by the characters. Man's product is the script that's written down as the characters are describing their actual experiences. And then the artists are recreating through the performance this artistic representation or interpretation of the original ideas that the characters represent. So in this case, the actors are removed from reality and are producing a lie. We could argue for an interpretation like this based on how the characters act when they see themselves portrayed by the actors. For example, the father claims that he feels reduced or false when he sees himself played by someone else. In the same way, the stepdaughter keeps laughing and interrupting when she watches the other actors try to portray the scene. The characters want things to be exact, like the wallpaper and the color of the sofa in the room, while the manager and actors want to get the general action down but provide their own interpretation. This is what happens to the real, or to the world of ideas, when it's put into literature. It's a departure from the truth of our experiences. Finally, we see a discussion about whether or not art should represent truth. The characters insist on truth, but the manager or director thinks that there are more important things. He doesn't want something to be too true. Too close to reality is heartbreaking, and no one wants to see it. This implies that art is supposed to reveal truth, but also lets us escape it too. As Plato said, it's a lie. This week, I want you to think about several things. First, you might consider whether or not you agree with Plato's philosophy about the function of art as represented in Act 2. Next, you will also notice as you read that there are many issues of gender, power, and social class at work in this play. So far, this lecture has focused on the philosophical side, but I want to encourage you to apply the cultural studies lens to your analysis of the play this week. In this case, where do we see issues of gender or social class at work in Act 2? Most of the time in cultural studies, these issues can be connected to power and relationships. Think about this act using these questions. Who has the most power between the sexes? Does the male or female get to speak more? Who seems to be in control? How does social class factor into this act? It is, is it important to think about why the scene between the father and the stepdaughter occurs due to poverty? How does this also demonstrate power relationships? Could we make an argument about social class and power when comparing the relationships between the characters, the director, and the actors? Who has the most control, and who is marginalized? I'm not going to answer these questions for you now, but I want you to use them as a lens from which to argue for your own interpretation of Act 2 this week. I look forward to hearing your responses if you participate in the optional discussion. And again, remember, there are no formal breaks to the action of the play. When the curtain comes down, even though it seems to be an accident, this is the end of Act 2. Thanks.